Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter 13. What I want to do today is I want to talk about Lot and what's going on in Lot's life and what we can learn from it. And then also is, is an extension how Lot managed to get in trouble, how Lot managed to get captured by the enemy, and what did the enemy do, and why did they do it, and why is it record, excuse me, recorded in Scripture? So we go to chapter 13, verse 1, and here's Abram, Abraham at this point called Abram. They hadn't changed. God hadn't changed his name yet. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he, his wife, and all that he had in Lot with him. And Lot here is specifically mentioned as, as traveling along with Abraham into the Negev, which is southern Israel. In verse 2, Abram was very wealthy in livestock and silver and gold, uh, much of which he had acquired while he was in, in uh, Egypt. And then verse 5, it says, Lot, who went with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents. Now, Lot obviously is not nearly as wealthy as Abram, but he still had a lot of stuff. He had, he had wealth even within himself. Now, verse 6 then goes on to say, the land was not able to support them while they were living together because they had so many possessions that they could not live together. And there were quarrels between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And why would there be quarrels? Well, for one thing, limited grazing areas and another limited water. And especially at the end of the day when people are tired and you get to the well and you've got to water the flocks, uh, who's who gets to water the flock and who has to wait? Uh, that was a big deal. So we can see why if they both had flocks and herds, um, that there would be quarreling between uh, their, their herdsmen. And then verse 7 goes on to say, the Canaan and the Perizzite, Canaanite and Perizzite were living in the land at that time. And that's letting you know that Abraham and Lot are living in the midst of, of enemies. And like us today, they had to pray and trust God for protection. Verse 8. So Abram, going to be a peacemaker here. This is a great model for us. Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between me and you and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, because we are relatives. Isn't the whole land before you? Please separate yourself from me. If you go to the left, then I will go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. Um, and remember that when you're in the biblical world, our world in the Western world faces north. Our maps ahead of us is north, but there ahead of them was east. So when he, when Abram says, if you go to the left, in that culture, that's north. This could, this verse could be uh, culturally translated. If you go north, I'll go south. If you go south, I'll go north. And I think that that's, um, there's more in that than we would think. Uh, let me bring up a map of Israel. And let's see, I'm going to share my screen. And so you're you're now looking at a map of Israel. Now, it, at this point in time, Abraham and Lot are they've come out of Egypt and they're coming into the southern Negev, which is this this area in here in Israel. And Abram's telling Lot, if you go north, I'll go south, and if you go south, I'll go north. But what actually happens? And by the way, this. At this time, it seems like, I can't prove it geographically, but it seems like the Jordan River just went through this area and then down and out through the Red Sea. That this huge depression that we now know as the Dead Sea didn't exist. What we can know for sure is that this southern part of the Dead Sea did not exist. At the time of Abram, this area here, which is which is very flat, by the way, this uh, south end of the Dead Sea is very shallow, and the bottom of it is very flat. And this was called the Valley of Siddim, or as we translate it in the REB, the Plain of Siddim. So notice that Abraham talked about going north and south and not to the east. 
my gut feeling is because that's because Abram knew, I'll stop sharing, um, that that's because Abram knew that to the east, there was trouble. In any case, he said, you know, go north, I'll go south, you go, go south, I'll go north. Uh, verse 10, but Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan. And that's what now is the southern basin of the Dead Sea, that all of it was well watered as you go towards Zoar. Now, Zoar is a city that's in the Great Rift Valley. And it's right now would be just south of the Dead Sea. Currently, it's unlocated. The, um, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah wiped out the, what we call the five cities of the plain. And so the, the exact position of Zoar, like the position of Sodom and Gomorrah, is not known. But in any case, it was well watered. Like as you go to Zoar, like the Garden of Yahweh, which of course would be the Garden of Eden, like the land of Egypt. And then the Bible informs us specifically, this was before Yahweh destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 11, so Lot chose the plain of the Jordan for himself, and Lot traveled east. Now, we can give Lot initially the benefit of the doubt. It is possible that Lot didn't know how wicked the people of that area were. It is possible. Frankly, it's unlikely. The reason I believe it's unlikely is because in those times when you know, Lot and Abram were still fairly small in, in the way they were, you know, little bands versus the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Amorites that were around them. They were kind of constantly taking the temperature of how people felt about them. What kind of danger were they in? That kind of thing for Abraham not to, I mean, for Lot not to know that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding area were evil. Um, it's a little hard for me to believe. It is possible. In any case, uh, Lot chose that area. Uh, it obviously was well watered. It obviously would have been very good for grazing and for raising, you know, cattle and, and sheep and goats and that kind of thing. So verse 11, Lot chose the plain of Jordan for himself. He traveled east. So they separated from each other. Verse 12, Abram lived in the land of Canaan. And Lot lived among the cities of the plain and moved his tent near Sodom. And then we have this ominous warning, but the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against Yahweh. It would not have taken Lot long to figure that out. But, and this is where, um, you know, again, like in Gail's prophecy about God giving us strength and in the fruit of the spirit, where it talks about self-control. You and I have to have the courage and the self-control to do what's right. Lot moves near Sodom. Now he finds out very quickly that the people are wicked. But instead of, you know, I mean, he's a herdsman for Pete's sake. He lives in a tent. Uh, he's got flocks and herds like Abraham does. How hard would it be for him to move and say, whoops, I made a mistake? Instead, he gets more and more deeply embroiled in the society. By the time we get to Genesis 19, what do we find? Abraham or Lot has become a judge. So you go to Genesis 19, the two angels won, the angels come to Sodom. Lot was sitting in the gate. So he's an, he's an elder. And in verse 2, he says to the angels, he doesn't know they're angels. He says to him, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house. So now he's living in the, uh, in the, in the town. And verse 9, the people reveal to us more what's going on with Lot. But they said, stand aside, because, you know, Lot was, was uh, going to block the door. They said, this one came to live as a foreigner. And he appoints himself as a judge, which probably didn't exactly happen. Now we will deal worse with you, Lot, than with them, than with the, the men that we want to accost. And they pressed hard on the man Lot. So Lot here is creating his own problem. I want to go forward to 2 Peter. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Because 
as you know, God rained fire down on Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed them. And he used Sodom and Gomorrah as a model, as an example of what will happen to wicked people. But let's look we, what we read here in 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, it says in verse 6, well, it's talking about verse 4, if God did not spare, uh, meaning that there's a day of judgment coming for sinners. Everybody has a choice not to sin. That's where you and I come in. You know, it's, you know, it's, it, it's difficult, but it's, it's a privilege to be able to insert ourselves in the lives of people. You know, and while I'm thinking about that, it is messy, but gosh, you know, it, it, recently I had a conversation with a man whose life is a mess and he, he was, he admitted that, you know, he played a part in doing this, but then um, he was upset at the church. And, he, and, 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 you know, I would say, honestly, with some reason, because he said, you know, I, I've been in the, and he had, he'd been in the church for years. And he said, then is, I'm, is, is there's, there's situations developing around me. He said, no one from the church showed up and spoke into my life, you know, for for support or guidance or help or whatever. And and he was, you know, pretty upset about it. And it makes sense to me. I mean, sometimes, you know, I love the idea that you and I are supposed to have courage and courage can get us, <laughs> courage can get us in trouble sometimes. You know, it can, but it's such an amazing privilege to be able to help one another. You know, Hebrews 10 says, you know, let's consider one another. You know, we've got to think about each other and then how we can how we can help to spur one another on to good and, and to love and good works, Hebrews says. And that's a that's a big job of the church. Who are you around? Who who uh whose life are you you know involved with to, to one degree or another? And and are we speaking into those people's lives? And here's uh, here's Lot, and you know it says, um, where was I? Um, verse six: God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them the ashes to ashes, which made them an example about what is to happen to ungodly people. We don't want that to happen to ungodly people. That's why we're ambassadors for Christ. That's why we witness. Uh, verse seven, and watch verse seven. And he rescued righteous Lot, who was worn down by the unrestrained way of life of immoral people, verse 8, for as he lived among them day after day, that righteous man kept tormenting his righteous soul by the lawless acts that he saw and heard. And what's happening there in that verse is it's translated in the REV, what you need to know is that in the Greek text, the verb, uh, in, in this case, the verb in the middle voice is the exact same form as the verb in the passive voice. So many, many of the English versions will translate this, that his righteous soul was tormented. But wait a minute, it doesn't have to read that way. The form of the verb is just is it's the same as the middle voice. Could Lot have left? Was he some kind of captive? No. In fact, when the angels came and said, look, God's going to burn this place, get out of here, he just packed up and left. He could have packed up and left any time. You know, why? And, you know, sometimes we get in situations, I mean, let's look at that verse again. For he, as he lived among them day after day, that righteous man kept tormenting his righteous soul by the lawless acts that he saw and heard. Now, there's obviously an extent to which you and I can't withdraw from the world. I wish the world was a really nice place. It will be one day. It's not right now. We can't pull out of the world completely. But we know the things that torment us. And a whole lot of them we can do things about. 
For example, if watching an hour of the news every day gets you very upset, drives up your blood pressure, you know, get your cortisol level, level through the roof and that kind of thing, cut it out. Turn the TV off. You know, you want to know what the news is? The news is the world's a bad place. It may be bad in different ways, but bottom line, every single night, the, world, the, the, the world's going to be a bad place. You're never going to turn on the news and not find the world a bad place. Ain't going to happen. So we, we, have to, we have to be proactive. And Lot wasn't, and he, and he could have been. And, you know, I mean, sometimes the situations that we're entangled with, um, there's there's <laughs> there's so many different reasons to stay entangled. Like it might have to do with our family. It might have to do with our finances. It might have to do, nah, 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 nah. you know, there's a hundred things. But if we if we can get uh, uh, somebody to talk with, you know, and calmly, you know, go have a cup of coffee or cup of tea or whatever and, and sit and talk. Hey, this is my situation. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just tormented. What do I need to do? And, and sometimes the things that we have to do to ex extradite ourselves from those things is, is frankly pretty challenging. You know, I mean, they're, uh, uh, you know what I mean? It, it can be pretty challenging, but you know, what is it? Gail's prophecy said, I'll give, give you great strength, not just strength, but great strength for your soul. And that's really true. God wants us to be blessed. He will help us get out of bad situations. And so we've just got to have the courage to draw the line and say, I, I'm not going to be part of this. And, and like I say, everybody's situation is different. And there's a whole lot of people that aren't in this situation at all. You know, there's there's a lot of people that aren't in a situation where their their souls being tormented every day by something. I would say pretty much at this time in my life that applies to me. I don't have anything that I need to extradite myself from, so that I'm you know because I'm being tormented every day. But there have been times in the past where I have been in those situations, and and then you've got to make decisions. And for whatever reason, Lot didn't. And it and it rose up to hurt him. So let's go back to Genesis uh, 13. And uh, well, we just finished that. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against Yahweh. And so basically, um, Lot separated himself and went to the wrong place. Genesis chapter 14, verse 1. Now, Genesis chapter 14, verse 1 is one of those two-edged swords in history um, because it, it speaks of a war and four very aggressive kings who uh, killed a lot of people, did a lot of damage and captured Lot, although Lot was rescued by Abram. But the fact of the matter is that what those four kings did, I think, really created space for Abram Isaac and Jacob to live in the land, you know, have their flocks and their herds, travel around the land and be relatively safe. And so that's what we're going to read about right now. And it's, it's very interesting how this happens. It says, now in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariak, king of Elisar, um, Chedor La, La Omer, I always have trouble, Chedor La Omer, king of Elam, and title king of Goim, they made war with Bera, king of Sodom. By the way, if you want to know um, who the king of Sodom was, his name is Bera. Uh, Bera is derived from the root evil. I don't think his mother named him that. You know, what's your name? Evil. <laughs> I think that basically he was an evil king, and so the Bible nicknames him evil. Uh, and same thing with Bersha, King of Gomorrah, Bersha comes from the Hebrew injustice. And again, I don't think his mother named him that, you know, Mr. Unjust. I think that there was just such a such evil and injustice around Sodom and Gomorrah that the king of Sodom got nicknamed Mr. Evil, and uh, the king of Gomorrah got nicknamed uh, Mr. Injustice. Uh, that goes to show you something about what was going on at those places. 
So they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Sinab, king of Adma, uh, Shimber, Shem, Shemeber, king of Zeboim, and the king and the king of Bela, which is Zor, Zoar, which is again south of the Dead Sea. Now, I want to show you what we've got on the map here, so that you can see what we're dealing with, because this is is absolutely gigantic when it comes to uh, the middle ancient Middle East and, and what's going on. So let me share my screen, uh, which I will do again. Share screen, bang. Okay, so here's, here's what's happening. Um, the first guy, Amraphel, uh, king of Shinar, was Shinar at this point encompassed Akkad and Sumer. This is again at the time of Abraham. So Shinar is this area right here. Now, remember, here is little Israel right here. So Shinar itself, look at the size of it. Here's, here's Shinar. Then you have uh, Ariok, king of El Elazar. Elazar is believed to be a city up here. We're not really sure, but somewhere up here in northern Mesopotamia. The next king is... Uh, Shedor Laomer, king of Elam. That's Elam down here. So he is the king of this area here. And the last guy is called Tidal, king of Goim. We do not know where the city of Goim was, but we know that Tidal is a Hittite name. And here's the Hittite empire up here. So the Goim, it would be surprising if it wasn't somewhere in this area. So what you've got is a, con a, a confederacy of four kings, and here's the size of it. That right there, that's the size of this confederacy. And they're going up five against five kings. And here they are right down in here in, in a little area that's probably about 12 or 15 miles by maybe 20 miles. And that's that's the five kings that are going to go up against them. Gee, no wonder they didn't stand much of a chance. Then it says, um, and I'll stop sharing. So it says, uh, these these five kings, verse three, all these joined together in the plain of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. And again, uh, Siddim is, uh, the plain of Siddim is now covered by water. It's the bottom half of the Dead Sea, what we call the Southern Basin. So again, that's going to be 15 or so miles long and maybe 12 miles wide. And that's where this plain was. And basically these four kings who came down this way, and we'll see that in a second, and these five kings met together and had a confab and agreed to serve uh, these kings. So verse four says they served Shedor Laomer for 12 years, and in the 13th year, the five kings said, we're done with this, we're not serving you anymore. And the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what that service entailed, for sure it would have entailed a, a uh, an annual tribute of sheep, goats, cows, probably silver, gold, maybe male and female slaves. Uh, but that's that's basically how you would serve in that time period. Verse five, so they rebelled. So uh, they rebelled in the 13th. It only took the kings of the north a year to amass an army. In the 14th year, uh, Shedor Laomer came and the kings who were with him. And then watch what happens here. They struck down the Rephaim and Ashtaroth Karnaim and the Zuzim and Ham and the Emim in Shava Kiriathaim and all the Horites in the hill country of Seir, Seir as far as El Paran, which is by the desert. Now, this is huge because as we take a look at this, what we find is that this entire list is Nephilim. The Nephilim were a fallen race, a mutated race of people that came, there was a, an outbreak before the flood described in Genesis chapter six. There was an outbreak after the flood and that's uh, in all over the, over the books of Moses. So we've got um, the, the Rephaim and the Rephaim were descendants of a guy named Rapha, 
And you can see this in the scripture in a number of places. For example, if we go to um, 2 Samuel 21, 16. Uh, let me see here. In 2 Samuel chapter 21, 16. And verse 15, it says there was a war between the Philistines and Israel, and the Philistines themselves had been infiltrated by the by the Nephilim. Um, David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David grew faint. And Ishbi Benob, who was one of the descendants of Rapha, and Rapha is one of, I believe, the original Nephilim, who then had descendants and descendants and descendants whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze. He being armed with a new sword intended to kill David, but Abishai, the son of Zariah, helped him and struck down the Philistine and killed him. The men of David swore an oath to him saying, you must not go out with us to battle anymore so that you do not extinguish the lamp of Israel. After this, there was a war with the Philistines, this time at Gob and Sibachai, the, the Hush Hathite killed Saf who was a descendant of Rapha. So in, among the Philistines, you've got Goliath, you've got this guy, uh, Ishbe, Ishbe Benob, you've got this guy named Saf. There was a war again with the Philistines at Gob, um, and El Nathan killed Goliath, the Gittite's brother. So Goliath was a Rep, uh, Nephilim descendant, and his brother was, uh, and then there was a war at Gath, it was a man of great size, eat me and blah, blah, blah. He was a descendant of Rapha. When he mocked Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, struck him down. These four were descendants of Rapha. So that was Ishbi Benob, Saf, Goliath's brother, and this man of great size, and of course, Goliath himself. So within the Philistine uh, nation, just in their, their battles against Israel, there were at least five of the Nephilim in their ranks. And of course, there would have been many more than that. So that, that go, that's about the, Rep, Rep, uh, the Rephaim going back to Genesis 14. So we're in verse five. So here's the Rephaim and then the Zu, uh, Zuzim in Ham. And if we go with this, Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 20. What, what I want to show you here is that um, in, in all of these cases, Deuteronomy 2, 20, the people that it said these, these, this army killed from the north were all, um, were all Nephilim. They were all huge, incredibly evil, controlling uh, Ear, um, unsavable, if you will, or um, un unable to live righteously. It was a genetic aberration. Um, so verse 20 to 20, that also is a count of the land of the Rephaim. Rephaim lived in it before, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim. So we have the Zamzumim or the Zumim as it's abbreviated. They live in Ham and they are Nephilim. And then um, let's go to, we go back then to Genesis 14. So we've got the, the Rephaim, we've got the Zuzim, and we've got the Emin, and they live here in Sheva Kiriathaim. So let's, let's see them. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 2, back to Deuteronomy chapter 2, and verse 9. Um, let's see. Um, Yahweh said to me, so now Deuteronomy, the Israelites are getting ready to cross the Jordan River. They're living in the plains of Moab. Yahweh said to me, do not harass Moab, nor provoke them to war, for I will not give you any of his land for a possession, because I've given it to Ar, to the children of Lot for a possession. Verse 10, the Emim lived in it before, a people as great and numerous as and as tall as the Anakim, like the Anakim, they are also regarded as Rephaim, but the Moabites called them Imim. And then verse 12 mentions the Horites, the same thing. So now when we go back to Genesis chapter 14, then what we're seeing here is that 
the entire Transjordan is, is basically infiltrated with the Nephilim. And when these four kings from the north come down, what, they, what do they do? They strike down the Rephaim, they strike down the Zuzim, they strike down the Imim, they, and they strike down the Horites. So basically, these, this super evil race that's controlling the Transjordan is, com is basically completely wiped out. And that then, it, we can imagine what would have happened if they hadn't been. You know, the adversaries working in them constantly, they would have been a, a, a lethal danger to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's amazing that the towns that are mentioned and the people that are mentioned, that that's, that's really what they did. And um, let's see if I can show you this here. I'm going to share my screen again because this this becomes uh, this comes out of uh, Bill Schlegel's um, satellite Bible Atlas. I'm going to share my screen. And so what do we see here? The kings of the north, way up north, off my screen, as you can imagine, and their huge armies. And what do they do? They come down, and it's going to, the towns that they're going to hit are all on what's called the King's Highway. And the first thing they do, they wipe out the Rephaim, they wipe out the Zuzim, they wipe out the Imim in this area, and then they just, and then they travel on down. I'll share another screen. And so they, they come down the Transjordan, wiping out those guys. Then they, they come and swing this way, and they're gonna wipe out the Horites in this area. Then they're going to go to Kadesh Barnea. We'll see that. Let's go back to Genesis 14. It says, um, the, the Emite, verse 6, and the Horites in the whole country of Seir, as far as El Paran. El Paran is the wilderness of Paran on this map. Here's the wilderness of Paran. So these armies came wiping out the Nephilim. Why, the, why is it mentioned the Nephilim? Two reasons that I can think of. One is because they were the sworn enemies of God. And two, they were the ones that were, that were so evil and controlling. They were the kings and rulers and power brokers, kind of like Goliath and the Philistine army. So he wipes these guys out. And he, he wipes out all of the Horites in this area, all the way down to the wilderness of Paran and gets over here to Kadesh Barnea. And it says that in verse um, uh, seven, then they turned back and came to Kadesh and struck down all the territory of the Amalekites. So the Amalekites were living in this general area and they, they killed off the Amalekites. And you know, they were sworn is, enemies of Israel, as you know. And, and then it says, and also the Amorites that lived in Hazazon Tamar. The Amorites are more people that were infiltrated by the Rephaim. Hazazon Tamar is also called En Gedi, and, and it's got other names as well. But it's this town right here on the Gulf of Aqaba. So the, they came down here, wiped out the Horites here, wiped out the Amalekites here, swung down, wiped out the Amorites here. And now they're going to go back north. And whereas they came down on, and now we'll go back to a different map, um, whereas they came down on the, the west side, I mean, the east side of the Jordan River Valley, the Rift Valley, they're going to go back up on the, uh, through the Jordan uh, Valley. And that's why they're going to stop here and attack Sodom and Gomorrah. So then as we read on, it says um, they turned back in verse seven and came to in Mishpat, that's Kadesh, struck down the territory of the Amalekites, as we saw. Also the Amorites that lived in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi, which we saw. Verse eight, now as they're turning back north, here you see on the map again, they're coming back north, who's here? The five kings of the cities of the plain. Remember this. 
This is a, a, a flat plain at this time, not a water basin. So these five kings are watching the, this army come north and they're like, if this is like Custer's last stand, we better take a stand here and fight these guys or we're gone. As it turned out, they got beaten. But anyway, uh, it says, verse eight, the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar, went out and they lined up in the plain of Siddim for battle against them. Now that's pretty brave. You got five little dinky cities against this gigantic army from the north. Verse nine, against Shador Laomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings against the five. And of course, they lost the battle. Verse 10, now the plain of Siddim was full of bitumen pits. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some people hid themselves in the, in the uh, bitumen pits. The rest of them fled to the hill country. And that left all these four kings from the north to take all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food and go back home to the north. Verse 12, they also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother who lived in Sodom and his possessions and went away. And again, there's Lot living in Sodom. He didn't have to live there. I don't think he should have lived there. He was tormenting his righteous soul by living there. And yet he decided to stay. Verse 13, one of the people who escaped, uh, someone who had escaped, uh, which verse 10 told us about, came and told Abram the Hebrew. By the way, this is the first use of Hebrew in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, now, Abram was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, the brother of Eschol and the brother of Aner, uh, and these were allies with Abraham. Verse 14, when Abram heard his relative was taken captive, he led his trained men born in his house, 318, and pursued them as far as Dan. This verse does not, uh, does not say that uh, Mamre the Amorite, Eschol, and Aner gathered their men and helped Abraham, but we find out later in the record that's exactly what happened. So Abram's army consisted of Abram himself, his 318 trained men, and the army, the small armies provided by Mamre, Eschol, and Aner. Um, and so he pursued them as far as Dan, which is considerably to the north. He split up his forces against them at night, he and his service, and struck them down and pursued them to Hobo, which is north of Damascus. So basically, he, he hit them as a lightning strike. They scattered. They tried to collect themselves, but Abraham and the army with him chased them all the way to north of Damascus. Uh, by the way, the, the town of Hoba has never been located. We don't know exactly where that is. And then verse 16, Abraham brought back all the possessions, and he also brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, and also the women and the people. The people would be the men. So he brought back um, the, the possessions, his relative, his relative Lot and his possessions, and the women and the men. Uh, that were taken. And it, it uses the word the people because theoretically the men of fighting age had already been in the battle and either were killed or were scattered. And so they weren't captured. So the people, the men that would have been taken away were basically the elder men and young boys. And they would be here listed as the people. Then verse 17 after the after the uh, return from the defeat, uh, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abraham at the Valley of Sheva. That's the king's valley. And that would in, in, involve uh, them. The Valley of Sheva is where the Valley of Kidron and the Valley of Hinnom meet just south of Jerusalem. And that Valley of Sheva then continues the flow of water that runs in the rainy season out down to the Dead Sea. And that's where the king of Sodom met Abraham just south, literally immediately south of Jerusalem. Verse 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. So Melchizedek was there. And verse 21, the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the people, take the possessions for yourself, which technically was allowable. 
uh, because the spoil went to the victor. Verse 22, Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand and sworn to Yahweh, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread nor a sandal strap nor anything that's yours so that you cannot say I have made Abram rich, <clears throat> which I think is a powerful statement on Abram's part. He really wanted to be able to tell people that God was the reason that he was wealthy, that he wasn't wealthy because anybody had just dumped stuff on him or given him stuff that he didn't deserve, even though technically he did deserve it. And I think that's a great example for us too, um, that we want to do things in our life in such a manner that God gets the glory. Uh, so what Abram says in verse 24, and I, the, the, the Hebrew is, is very crisp here. We've tried to represent this in the in the REV text. Nothing for myself. Um, the the Hebrew is even probably a little crisper. Not for me. I mean, just basically that's what it amounts to. Not for me. He just says, hey, I, my hands are off. I'm not taking a thing. Then he, but then he protects the people. He says, but what the young men have eaten and the share of the spoil of the men who went with me, Anna, Eskol, and Mamre, they must get their share. Why must they get their share? Because they and their armies helped Abraham fight and, and win back Lot. So this is a, a very interesting record. And in Genesis 13 and 14, again, it's almost in two pieces where we see Lot and the mistakes he made and how he should have extradited himself from a bad situation. But because of weakness of will and entanglement with the world, he didn't do it. And we need to we need to not follow his example, but, you know, get, get some kind of sense of when we're getting too entangled in the world and get out of it so we can be at peace and be obedient to God. And then the second part is understanding why God is telling us this. I mean, he went through and told us, you know, the cities in which these Rephilim, these Nephilim lived, the names of them and how these kings killed them off, including around the, the southern Israel, the Horites, the Amalekites, the Amorites. And I am quite confident that part of the reason that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were as free to live in the land as they were at the time they lived, and there was a lot of time between, you know, this time period here, Abraham hadn't even had Isaac yet. And then you had to have the life of Isaac, and then you had to have most of the life of Jacob in the promised land. And that, the, um, the, the freedom and the safety in that, I believe, at least in part, and I'm going to say large part, came from the fact that all these completely wicked tribes had basically been wiped out and the devil had to kind of start over again and and, uh, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were able to take advantage of that. And then when by the time Moses had died um, and then Joshua came back into the land, the Canaanites and the evil people had multiplied again, but then Joshua took care of them and then David finished them off. So anyway, thank you for your attention tonight. Uh, this was really interesting to study and to learn uh, some of the stuff I didn't know until I began translating this area with Bill. And we began saying, why is this here? What does this mean? That kind of thing. And it's just a super blessing to get to share it with you. So thank you very much for your attention. To